So let's dig into some pelvis and rib cage mechanics. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have NeuroCoffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Today is Wednesday. Busy day, tight schedule, but quick reminder, Coffee and Coaches Conference call tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Link will be on my professional Facebook page. Please join us. Those of you that are gonna, gonna join us for the call, make sure you have seen all of the most recent uh, coaching consultations. We're gonna pick the best one that everybody likes the best and we're gonna send them some, some free stuff. So, so please join us. Okay, um, today's Q&A comes from Manuel who actually joins us on the uh, Coffee and Coaches Conference call quite frequently. And we dig into some, some axial skeletal mechanics, starting with some diaphragm discussion, getting into some rib cage and, and, and pelvic dynamics. And, and we talk a little bit more about uh, the, the right oblique orientation um, of the pelvis. For those of you that, that aren't familiar, this would be associated with, with a compressive strategy that, that occurs here in the pelvis and, and it drives the the sacrum up and the, the left ilium up and over. And so what we end up with is a, an orientation that brings the, the left pelvis up and over on the right side. So this is just one of the potential compensatory strategies. But we, we dig into that a little bit more because I think a lot of people get a little confused with it. So I think it's a very, very useful call. Manuel is actually asking some really good questions on this that I think um, those of you that are interested in this mechanical element and trying to understand it will find very, very useful. So enjoy the call today. I will see you guys tomorrow at 6 a.m. Coffee and Coaches Conference call as usual. Have a great day. Okay. All right, Manuel, what's your question? Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, uh, first, I wanted to talk about the, the diaphragm. And I was wondering, um, you know, we've talked about how um, there's asymmetry in the body. Does it does the does the diaphragm go straight down, or does it go down kind of unevenly, or does it go down like at an angle, to following on, the current of the body? So, so think about it. it depends on what we're doing, right? Uh, it, yeah, I would guess in normal respiration. Right. So if you if you look, all you can do is go to go to Google Images and pull up a bunch of uh, chest X rays, and you'll see you'll see an asymmetrical representation internally. Mm -hmm. um, some of this is due to, to uh, abdominal contents, and, and then it's about pressure management and position management. And so you'll see, a, you'll see degrees of this, of this asymmetrical representation, but you'll see some that actually look quite symmetrical as well. And so, mm -hmm. again, it's going to depend on some of your, your structural elements and, and then also, again, movement behaviors, because we have to push abdominal contents around and we have to control the position of them as they are creating all of these momentums and turns inside. And so, again, we, I, I talk a lot about this non-uniform representation uh, of the diaphragm under most circumstances because of the, the shape of the abdominal contents, the position of the abdominal contents and gravity that's what's going to produce a lot of this asymmetrical representation. Both sides will go down, but you can find research on this. They actually, they actually study the position of, of the diaphragm, and you'll see that under certain circumstances, you'll see a limited excursion on one side versus the other. Um, so there's nothing unusual about it, um, but, but to, to get caught up in, in degrees of, of things, I don't think I'd worry too much about it. Just understand the general representations and as to how that might influence how we move the, the air volume around inside. So we create these shapes and turns and such. Mm -hmm. um, so does that mean that one side will expand more than the other as you breathe? Potentially. Potentially. Mm -hmm. you, have, you, have, you, have, you have uneven forces in the abdomen mm -hmm. relative to the influence of gravity, the, the volume of the guts, the, the weight of the guts, all create demand, right? So if, if, you know, I have a huge small intestine that's in there, that's going to be biased in, in a certain position. I've got a big liver that's biased in a certain position. And I, I talk about those because their, their volumes are actually very, very great. And they actually create forces in the same direction. So I have a lot of internal volume that produces a lot of, a lot of uneven force. 
And so I have to control that. The diaphragm is one element of one element of that. We have a lot of musculature in the axial skeleton and, and superficially that's going to control those positions. So once I superimpose other demands other than just gravity against uh, whatever structure I have while I'm breathing, I also have the influence of, of movement. And, and you know, as well as I do, that as soon as you put a heavy barbell in somebody's hands, a lot of stuff changes too. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it, um, it, you know, that, that, that question came up because from the early coaches co uh, coffee call that we had, cause we were huh? talking about like a tube. And then if you, you know, how, how the diaphragm is within that tube. And if you squeeze one side, it expands Correct. You have pressure on one side, you have uh, expansion on the other side. So. Uh, there's a, I tell you what, if, if, if you look up and again, go to Google images, it's always fun to look at this stuff. But if you get, if you do a search on Barry Sanders back when he was a running back for the Detroit lions, mm -hmm. and if you want to see some of the coolest representations of an athletic performance where somebody is compressing one side of their body and expanding the other, there's some great pictures of him because mm -hmm. he was, he was the best at shape change that, uh, that I've ever seen as a running back. Um, it's pretty, pretty impressive um, mm. as part of what he was capable of doing. Um, and, and again, it, it just gives you a nice little visual. It's like, oh, I can see how you have to compress here to create this turn or this shift. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, so uh, another question I had was, when, whenever you have a, an asymmetrical ISA, mm -hmm. uh, I think you regard that as a, as a twist, like yeah. the twisted. Yeah. Um, just bigger twist. So uh, do you expect the pelvis to turn in the direction of the, the wider side or do you, or do you expect a, um, you, uh, you know, uh, the pelvis to go, uh, the thorax to go one way and the pelvis to stay facing another way or go the opposite way. Okay. So, so the upper thorax and the pelvis are going to turn in the same direction. Yeah. We've talked about that. That's why. Okay. I was yeah. But Here's, here's where the confusion is going to lie. And here's why you'll get different opinions. It depends on where you look as to how you describe the turns. Mm. Because if you look at the spine segmentally, you have relative position changes in the spine from segment to segment. So if I was looking at, say, a T5 relative to the T10, I would say that they were turned in opposite directions. And so then this creates a massive amount of confusion for people. What we want to look at is, so if, if we use the, the upper back as the representation of dorsal rostral, so that space between the scapula, and if we look at the sacrum, the relative positions that, that they're going to turn is always going to be the same. Mm. Okay. Maybe not to the exact same degree, which again, confounds a lot of people. But what we have to look at is we have to look at the general representations because what we're doing when we move is we're moving the axial skeleton through space with our extremities. So people get really distracted by arm and leg movement and they say, well, this arm's going forward and this arm's going back. So one must be ER, one must be IR. It's like, no, they're both in ER, right? Because I got to create the turn. I got to create the representation through the scapula so I can turn the axial skeleton in the right direction. So this is why we don't want to turn, we don't want to turn the thorax and the, and the sacrum in different directions because it's really uncomfortable and it's almost impossible to breathe if it is possible. Okay. It's a great way. It's a great way to, to put so much stress on the connective tissues that you end up with some form of destruction. In fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I noted, uh, I, I posted a video, uh, a link to one of your videos about uh, a right oblique pelvis. Uh -huh. pelvic uh -huh. And so I was wondering if the strategies from that video apply to a left oblique orientation or if they would be different. Okay. So, so in, in most static circumstances where we're looking at people either in a static position, slow motion or passive range of motion and such, it would be very rare. It'd be very rare to see a, a left oblique orientation. It does happen in performance. In fact, we want it to happen in performance because that is actually one of those limit limiters to performance. So if we, so, you know, all the weightlifting videos and, and pictures that you post on the uh, IFAST University, 
So, so all of those are going to be in these static symmetrical positions in most cases, unless you're showing me like a split jerk or something like that. Um, and so it's really easy to see these orientations in space. When we're talking about a dynamic athlete that has to change direction. So for me to go into a, like I say, a left side cut. So as I go into a cut and come out of a cut, I'm going to use that left oblique orientation into the cut. And then I'm going to reverse it out of the cut. Okay. But because of the, of the force, the internal forces that, that I'm always managing, there is a bias okay, to the rotation that occurs inside. And so the right oblique would show up under these, like I said, slow speed, kind of staticky kind of, kind of representations. So if I can acquire a left oblique position, I'm throwing a party because then I know I've got somebody that's got the, the normal representation against the internal forces and then they can manage those internal forces where they would get magnified and this is what tip, people typically protect themselves against. So when you're watching an Olympic weightlifter and they start, they, when they go down into their, <clears throat> their catch or their deep squat and you see that pelvis kind of shift forward in one, one direction, the one knee sticks out farther, the shin angle is steeper on one side than it is on the other. They're actually using that, that strategy to control internal forces and then the magnified external forces. If you can get somebody... And think about this for a second. Think about how many people you have that, that use a right leg forward lead on their split jerks. It's pretty rare. It's probably more common to see a left leg forward on, on, a, on, a, the, on the jerk because it's easier for them to manage that position than it is in the alternative. So if you ever get a right leg lead forward, that's probably somebody that's got a pretty decent amount of control in regards to the internal force management and then the weight overhead. And that's probably a decent Olympic weightlifter because then they, they, they can do a lot of this bilateral symmetrical stuff a little bit more effectively than a lot of people can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually looking into some data about that to see uh, the, you know, the proportion of people who go right leg versus left leg in elite it, lifting. It's, it, I tell you, like I said, it, it's not that there's, there's not right leg leaders. It's just the fact that it's, it's a much more difficult element of control mm -hmm. um, just because, again, you, you always have to look at the combination of influences. So we've got the internal stuff that we always have to manage, right, as, as a human being. And then we have the superimposed loads on top of us with, a, with the barbells. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at um, like Olympic divers, <clears throat> there are people, there are divers. And I think actually the guy that's ranked number one in the world, I think he can do this too. He can actually spin. Um, he can actually spin in the opposite direction. He can spin to the left, mm -hmm. which is usually very, very, very difficult to do. I mean, I'm sorry, he spins to the right, which is difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Most people go with it. That's why, that's why running tracks turn left. That's why race tracks turn left. Cause they, they kind of figured out pretty early on. I would imagine that, you know, if you try to turn right, you're kind of either slow or you get really sick to your stomach, mm. especially 200 miles an hour. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough turn. It's a tough turn. All you gotta do is, is, is um, if you run a 200 on a, on a, on a running track, right. A t traditional 200, then run it back, then run it, you know, against, the, the typical direction and, and you'll see how hard it is to make that right hand turn. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Cause I've been, I've been noticing a lot of different kinds of shape changes in the weightlifters that I'm looking at and I'll, I'll post more on the forum, but you know, I just had a lot of questions about yeah. what I'm seeing and yeah. I wanted to get a better understanding before I, I put it out there. Absolutely. Just keep it coming. Cool. Awesome. All right. Great call young man. Thank you. Thank you. I will see you. I will see you on the uh, coffee and coaches call as usual. And I'll see you in IFAST you. Okay. All right. See you. Right, oh, there you go. Great <laughs> job. Love the, love the mug. And yeah. Well, we'll take that. Have a good mm -hmm. day.